Right guys, welcome to this A-level psychology video on retrieval failure. The video is going to consist of a brief outline of the theory, followed by a couple of research studies, and then some evaluation points to finish up. You can always skip to any of those sections by using the timings in the description below if you want to. Any exam question videos that I've got for this lesson will appear at the top of your screen now and will appear again at the end of the video. And finally, if you find this video useful, please go ahead and let me know by hitting the like button. So, retrieval failure is an explanation for forgetting in long-term memory. It suggests that people forget things due to the absence of cues. Cues are pieces of information that were present at the time and have been coded with that memory. They can be meaningful or they can be completely irrelevant to the memory in all ways other than they happen to be there when the memory was initially coded. They can also be internal or external, which is something that we'll come back to in a couple of minutes when we look at different types of retrieval failure. Now at the very heart of retrieval failure is something known as the encoding specificity principle, which was put forward by Tolving in 1983 and is a very simple concept that says that any cues present at the time of coding a memory must also be present at the time of retrieval. If that's not the case, then forgetting in some form or another is likely to occur. However, it is also important to note at this point that the information isn't completely gone. It's still there somewhere in your memory. It's just that we can't access it without the relevant cues. Now, I said earlier that cues could be both internal and external, and that links to the fact that there are two types of retrieval failure that you need to know for A-level psychology. You have context-dependent forgetting and state-dependent forgetting. Okay, so we're just going to go through what both of those are in a little bit more detail. Context-dependent forgetting is when your recall is dependent on external cues. Okay, so these could be things like specific locations, certain smells, or specific objects, for example. It's a little bit like when you go somewhere and you think you've never been there before, but then you see something in that place, like a landmark or maybe something really small, like a specific tree or a building or something like that. And then all of a sudden you remember that you have been there before, but you couldn't remember anything about that place before seeing the external cue that then triggered the memory. State-dependent forgetting, on the other hand, is when recall depends on internal cues, such as emotions or a change in internal state like being drunk. So, for example, if you make a memory when you're sad, angry, or under the influence of alcohol, then you're more likely to remember that memory when you recreate those conditions and are sad, angry, or drunk. Now, before we finish up the outline, there are two studies that looked into both context-dependent and state-dependent forgetting that we are going to go through. Luckily for us, they are almost identical in every way, and they are very, very useful for both the outline and the evaluation sections of this topic. So the first study is by Godden and Baddeley, who looked at context-dependent forgetting. They had 18 participants and asked them to learn and recall word lists on land and underwater. They used a repeated measures design, which created the four groups that you can see on the screen now, with each participant taking part in all four conditions over four separate days. Their findings were really simple. When the conditions matched, the recall was the highest, with recall being around 40% lower in the non-matching conditions. The second study was conducted by Carter and Cassidy, and like I said before, it is almost identical. It was also a repeated measures design, but in this one the participants had to learn and recall words and passages of prose, either under the influence of an antihistamine drug which made them drowsy, or not under the influence of that drug. Okay, And so just to be clear, we are studying state-dependent forgetting here because the internal state of the participants was different due to the feeling of drowsiness. You've got the same 
set up in terms of the four groups that were created and you can see on the screen as well that just like with Godden and Baddeley's research they found that when the states matched recall was the highest. Okay so both of these studies suggest that when the cues are absent forgetting is more likely to occur. Now before moving on I just want to take a minute and point out that you've got two pieces of research now that you can use in a variety of ways. So the question is what's the best way to actually utilize both of these studies in order to get the most marks possible. Okay, so you've got a variety of options. You could, if you wanted to, put both pieces in your outline as research that has investigated retrieval failure. Okay, you could also put both pieces in your evaluation section as some research support. Now, in my opinion, both of those options are not ideal because it's too repetitive. Okay, you're not going to demonstrate depth, you're just going to put two studies in your outline, which means that you're automatically going to not be able to talk about some of the other stuff that's important for retrieval failure, and if you put both of those studies in your evaluation section, then you're effectively just giving the same point twice, which means that you're not going to get the marks for the depth there either. Okay. In my opinion, the best way forward is to mix and match, Okay, so to do a little bit of both. So put one study in your outline, for me that would be Carter and Cassidy, and use the other study in the evaluation section, that would be Godden and Baddeley. Okay, I'll explain why in a little while when we actually get into the evaluation bit, but that's how I would do it. Okay, I'd be spreading the detail between my outline and my evaluation section, thereby maximizing the amount of marks that I'm likely to get in any essay. Okay. All right then, so we are at the end of the outline, which means it's time to have a look at a couple of evaluation points. I've got four in total, but one of them's got a little bit of an extra element to it, so really it's more like four and a half. I'll do them all in short first, talk you through them, and then I'll go on and show you what they could look like when put into an essay. A strength of retrieval failure as a theory of forgetting is that it has an impressive range of research that supports it, okay? It is a very extensively researched explanation and the studies by Goddard and Badley and Carter and Cassidy are just two examples of that. All of the research that's been done shows that the lack of relevant cues at recall can lead to both context and state dependent forgetting in everyday life. Okay, now for anyone who uses the green haired girl textbook will recognize that point. The book doesn't really give you much more to talk about. Okay, it's a fairly generic point, and personally, I don't particularly like it because it is just quite generic. So, I said earlier that the studies covered in the, in the outline would be useful in the evaluation section. So, I would use one of them at this point. Okay, I would explain what was done and I would explain what was found because evidence like a study will just add detail to your evaluation point. Okay, obviously, it goes without saying that if you used one of these studies in the outline, then use the other one in the evaluation section, otherwise you're just going to end up having a fairly repetitive essay, and you're likely to not get a huge amount of credit for that. Um, but I would definitely, at that point, follow up that generic information with a study from the outline. Okay, and then in a little while, when I show you the actual full paragraphs, I will show you how you could do that. Okay, moving on, we have a counterpoint, and that is a limitation that was put forward by Baddeley himself, who argues that context effects are not actually very strong, especially in everyday life. He argued that different contexts have to be very, very, very different indeed before they have any effect on recall, as was the case in his research where people were learning things on land and recalling them underwater. However, in reality, in everyday life, people are more likely to learn something in one room and recall it in another. Okay, so if you take an exam, for example, then you're more likely to learn something in a classroom and then have to recall it in an exam hall. And that's unlikely to result in too much forgetting because the environments are not going to be that different from one another. Okay, so that means that retrieval failure due to lack of contextual cues might not actually explain very much everyday forgetting. 
Another limitation is that research suggests that context effects may depend on the type of memory being tested. So Godden and Badley repeated their underwater experiment in 1980, but this time asked their participants whether they recognised a word that had been read to them, rather than asking them to retrieve the word for themselves. Under those circumstances, there was no context-dependent effect at all. Performance was the same across all four conditions for all participants. Therefore, retrieval failure may be a limited explanation for forgetting because it may only apply when a person has to recall information for themselves rather than recognize it. Okay, and then finally, a big strength of research into retrieval failure is its practical applications. For example, one of those is in the cognitive interview, where the police will use what we know about retrieval failure to help witnesses remember more accurate details about an event. And they do that by reconstructing the scene, both mentally and physically, in order to provide both environmental and emotional cues which could jog the witness's memory. Now, you've got two bits of extra information here that you might want to add into this point if you want to try and make it a little bit more detailed. Okay, so number one is on top of that, you have TV programs such as Crime Watch, which will regularly produce reconstructions of a crime and broadcast them live to the general public. And that has been done on several occasions with very successful outcomes, as was the case with the murder of Daniel Jones in 2001, for example. Okay, so you've got an actual application that has been used and has a successful outcome. Okay, so that's an extra bit of detail that you could put in. You've also got another bit of detail, which is that using research into retrieval failure in this way also has a very positive impact on the economy, okay? Because increasing witness accuracy means that there's a greater chance of the police prosecuting the right criminal from the outset. And that results in a reduction of wasted money on things like wrongful arrests, questioning and court hearings, as well as compensation payouts for false convictions, which will ultimately save the criminal justice system money that can be then invested elsewhere. Okay, so you've got two extra bits of information there. They're both optional extras. My suggestion would be that if you can't remember both of them, then maybe just talk about one, because it will just give your point a little bit of extra punch. However, either way, the link for this evaluation point is that our understanding of Q-dependent forgetting has had a positive impact on policing and has contributed to many offenders being brought to justice. Okay, so let's have a look at these evaluation points in full just before we finish up. So here is the first point. Okay, you can see that you've got those first two bullet points there that are kind of quite generic, but then I've added in the research by Godden and Baddeley in red just to give a little bit of detail to that point. Okay, the reason I've chosen Godden and Baddeley to be the one that I talk about in the evaluation section is because the next two evaluation points are based on Godden and Baddeley's research. Okay, so it makes sense to have that study in your evaluation point because it just adds a little bit of continuity to your evaluation section. Okay, Carter and Cassidy will therefore go into my outline. Okay, you've then got your counterpoint, which is of course directly linked to Godden and Baddeley's research, followed by the recall versus recognition point, which is also directly linked to Godden and Baddeley's research. You then have your practical application. As you can see, it's quite a long point, but it is a good point to have. The third sentence or the third kind of point in that paragraph is your first optional extra, which you can get rid of if you want to, but it is a nice one to have. And then if you want to have a look at what it looks like with the paragraph about the positive impact on the economy, then it's going to look something like this. Okay, so as you can see, it gets a little bit longer, but it does add a little bit more detail. Okay? And that brings us to the end of the video. I hope it's all made sense, and I hope it's been useful. If you have any questions, please pop them in the comment section below, and I will do my best to get back to you ASAP. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you in the next one.